We are on our way to one of the remotest villages in Meghalaya that is approximately 135 kilometers from Shillong. There are two options to reach this village. One is via Mairang, Markasa and Jaido in West Khasi Hills and the other way is via Maukruwat in Southwest Khasi Hills. We take the Maukruwat route which is some 78 kilometers from Shillong passing through the Maungap road and from Mokurwat to Wakaji, it's 57 kilometers and the total traveling time is about 5 hours from Shillong to reach Wakaji village in southwest Khasi Hills, our destination today. On our way, we pass by Weiloi and the legendary mountain Lom Semper, which dominates the landscape and is immortalized in the folklore around these parts. The road to Wakaji is a long and winding one, crossing Makruwat town and passing by the Rilang viewpoint, which overlooks the Rilang river. The road along the way is under repair, serving as a lifeline for all the villages in these remote parts of southwest Khasi Hills. It cannot be denied that even though the journey to these parts is a rough and tough one, the paved roads have greatly eased the lives of the people here. Where their forefathers had to journey on foot for days, nowadays the travel is much faster and relatively easier. Roads have brought about a change in the physical and mental landscape in many parts of remote Meghalaya. Southwest Khasi Hills is a wild and rugged countryside with a number of mountains and rivers crisscrossing the land. We move on to our destination some 50 kilometers away, passing through the Rilang River, the villages of Potdei, Diwan and other nondescript village hamlets. The landscape is mostly a dry barren one with patches of low-lying paddy fields surrounded by hills occasionally dotted with clusters of pine forests. We pass through Saw Sinyang village which is much bigger. St. Mary's school on a slightly higher elevation is one of the few huge concrete structures found in this remote area of small tin and wooden houses. bitumen paved roads gradually gave way to the dusty tracks but we were not complaining we were visitors for just one day and so to endure this rough road for a day and make a fuss about it is not right for the very reason that people who live in these parts have to live in this wilderness for a lifetime it doesn't seem fair that this part of Meghalaya is least developed in spite of its abundant natural resources like uranium, coal and timber. The lack of development is a complex and multi-dimensional issue which needs to be addressed at the earliest in the interest of the people living here. While the state government has a big role to play, 
It is really the cooperation and proactive role of the local community which matters most and which will in the long run contribute to the progress of the district. Passing through some more dirt tracks, we stop for a while near Miriam village at the foothill of Lom Kalai Longsungun, a standalone monolithic mountain that offers a 360 degrees view of the land around. The footpath from the base to the top of the mountain are signs of a concerted effort to make a viewpoint where one can see for miles on end all around the countryside. From the top, the landscape looks barren except for patches of forest scattered around. Further down the road, we pass by the demolished structures, apparently the quarters of the labourers constructing the Nongstan Wakhaji Road, which was abandoned a few years back after stiff opposition to the two-lane road project by a number of NGOs and local communities. Without taking sides, the proposed road project could have made the lives of the people in these parts much easier. But for the serious threat that uranium mining poses to the community at large, the loss of a valuable lifeline has also resulted in many opportunities lost for the people who have nothing to look forward to in this bleak landscape. After more than two hours on the road, we were nearing our destination. Passing through Nongdilon village and Umdolan on the way, our journey took us further into the area which supplies most of the charcoal in the Khasi hills. In the horizon, the twin peaks of Lom Kubut, Lom Kuba make an appearance indicating that we were just a few kilometers away from Wakhaji. Wakhaji village sits at the crossroads where the roads going to Umjaran village to the north, Plang Dilon, the headquarters of the Saim or chief of Hima Langrin towards southeast and Domesiat Mothaba towards southwest cross each other. After that long road trip, we have reached Wakaji and I'm standing at the crossroads where you have the Hima Nobo Sopo, Hima Langrin and Hima Nongstoin behind me. This is the remotest of the remote areas in Khasi Hills. The village has grown through the years as a center of trade in this area. It borders three chieftainships to the east, the Hima of chieftainship Nobo Sopho, to the north, the Hima Nongstoin, and to the south and west, the Hima Langrin. There are three clans of Kur who are the original inhabitants and own most of the land in the area, namely the Mirthong, Palyar, and Langrin clans. Wakaji shares its border with another adjacent village, Mao Khlaitngap. Visiting for the first time sometime in the 90s, I remember this village as a small desolate village with hardly any houses. Today, it's a big surprise to see so many houses and concrete structures which indicate that the village has grown through the years. There are 150 households in Wakaji and the adjoining area. There are two lower primary schools, one middle and a secondary school. The village has a primary health center which caters and provides basic medical care to Wakaji and the villages nearby. The population is 100% Christians with 85% Presbyterian and 40% Catholic.
There is also a post office and Anganwadi center and is connected to the outside world through the Jio and Selwan mobile networks as well as satellite television. It however lacks a population engaged in cultivation and the main source of livelihood is basically trading namely the timber trade and production of charcoal which is an environmental hazard resulting in the loss of valuable green cover and natural habitat. We met some of the village elders and interacted with them seeking whatever information we could get about their way of life, culture and the landscape. ชาลุมนกเรศชาลุมนกเรศชาเวโรอืมตางบางยิมละบันตีปกติเตยอุชุเป็นสงหาตะกะดูกัดกุ้มกะจิงะทุอุกยาวเท่าจงยะกิซอ
From Mount Nore, we start our next journey to the Kuba Cave, somewhere on the slope of the mountain. It's a jungle trail with no well-defined track or trail, taking us across shrub forests and dense vegetation which we had to literally crawl through at some places. We passed through a shallow cave and rock shelter formed by years of erosion of the sandstone caused by rain and flowing water. It may be mentioned that this area also receives a lot of rainfall during the monsoons, causing a network of caves and underground passages. Our guide shows us some footprints of small animals and jungle fowl made on the wet soil surface. Not too many people frequent these parts because of the absence of a well-known track. After about 30 minutes of walking, we reach our destination, an old cave hidden from view by the thick vegetation. The entrance is dark and damp as not much sunlight reaches the frontal part of the cave. A pungent, acrid smell dominates the air around us, caused by the droppings of thousands of bats that have made this cave their home. The cave entrance is filled with dirty swarm like water accumulated from rainwater and groundwater. In the past, they used to be boats for visitors to get inside the cave. But at the moment, it does not look too inviting to wade across or to use a boat to move into the dark tunnel. So, I'm at the entrance of this Krem Kuba. As you can see, this is full of water and you'll have to take a boat to go inside this cave which extends to about 60 feet and beyond. This cave has not been explored yet and you can smell the ammonia from the droppings of the bats. There are thousands of bats here in this cave, Kuba. It will take another time to come and explore this cave. We leave Krem Kuba and head back to the village. A truck loaded with sacks of charcoal ready to be transported outside stood on the road at Wakaji. This was a grim reminder of the unsustainable methods and destructive economic activity practiced by the people here. This was the only source of income for many households and unless alternative sources of livelihood are created, it seems that the area was heading for a disaster. Now that uranium mining has been stopped, it would appear that the threat to the ecosystem here is not from uranium but from rampant timber felling and charcoal burning. So we are on our way to Domasiat, but the fact remains that the main source of livelihood in this Wakaji Domasiat area is charcoal. We move to the southwest towards Domasiat village where the uranium story started many years ago. It was in Domasiat that the Uranium Corporation of India Limited 
had set up camp and explored the uranium-rich countryside for years. After the stiff opposition from the NGOs and locals, they were forced to leave the area and abandon the mining plans. One of the major reserves of uranium in India is found in Domesiat. The Uranium Corporation of India Limited UCIL, had proposed to set up an open cast uranium mining and processing plant at Mautaba. It had begged Gleng Bindeng Soyong Mautaba project in Meghalaya for rupees 1,100 crores. The uranium ores are spread over mountainous terrain in deposits varying from 8 to 47 meters from the surface in and around Domesiat, 135 kilometers west from Shillong. I'm in Domesiat and this is one of the houses, the remains of the headquarters of the Atomic Minerals Division. And from here they operated their mining in and around this place called Domesiat and down to Mothaba. It was from here that all the operations, all the work of AMD regarding uranium mining happened. Uranium mining would have changed the lives of the Lingdo Langren family who live in about nine households at Domesiat. Most of the land here belongs to Spiliti Lingdo Langren, the 89-year-old woman who refused to sell her land to the authorities for fear of environmental degradation, radiation and health hazards, presumably caused by uranium mining. We pay this brave woman a visit and find out what prompted her to oppose uranium mining. <laughs> So I'm in the residence of Spiliti Lingdo Langren. She is one of the last of the Mohicans who oppose the AMD from mining uranium in Domasiat here. If it had not been for her, this place would have been a mining area for uranium. It is the decision of Kong Spiliti Lingdo Langren that has saved this environment in Domasiat from uranium mining. Until we meet again in another village, goodbye.